Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the North Shore Hospital. As many of you know, I've been in hospital for the last two weeks. Thus, there's been no word. <clears throat> A very big thankfulness to my family, my grandchildren, the nurses and doctors that supported me during my journey in hospital. Without them, I would never have been able to mend as quickly as I have. And such wonderful care and medical technology that's available that God only gives to us. I want to talk to you today about rising up much bigger, much higher in God than where you are right now. <clears throat> A higher place that you have allowed yourself to be and settled for and somehow you've stopped at a level. But God has something way, way bigger and way more for you. A lot of people have a vision of what might make their life happy and complete. If only I had a car. If only I had a new house. If only I had a house with a view of the beach. If only I had more money. And only if, if, if. And the cry of the heart is never fully satisfied. I'd happy, be happy, very happy, and never ask for anything else in my life. But sadly, that is never, ever the case. And I want to say to you, no matter what impression you may have formed in your own heart, whatever impression you've got in your own mind falls far, far short of what God has intended for those that sincerely love him and which he has in store for you. And let me assure you, he has much, much more for your life, so much more. In fact, the word says this, the eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that, that seek him and love him. The eye has not seen. The mind can't comprehend. Here's something special for you something unique, something above all that you can think or imagine, something that only God has created in your own personality, something that God has done in your own DNA, something that God has put you through experiences, whether they be good or bad, that God has allowed you to go through, which makes following the Lord a supernatural, unique experience. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? I want to talk this morning about coming out and going in and going to a much higher place in God. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we thank you for the touch of heaven that you have granted this little town of Snell's Beach to minister your word to the world. And we don't even have to catch a plane to reach even one lost soul. We thank you for all the places where your word has been heard from sailors off the coast of shores around the world, people living in countries that we've never heard of, where your word has been told in a simple and easy and understandable way that even a child can understand it. We think of all the people that are lonely at home, wondering if anyone would actually cares for them, wondering if anybody will visit them. Maybe they're in a rest home, maybe they're in a hospital, and nobody bothers to visit them. But God, you do. God, anoint this word as my voice is limited. But your voice is unlimited and can speak and reach many more people than I can. Speak to every heart this morning. Speak to every circumstances. And let this word not come void. We ask us in your precious name. If you have a Bible, please turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whoever shall lose his life for my sake will find it. In this story, Luke 17, Jesus was also talking about a similar incident, incident, a similar thought, and it speaks about Lot's wife, about the life that could have been. And he says, remember Lot's wife. Lot was a man taken out of a perishing, shocking city. It was a place undergoing the judgment of God, 
And in his mercy, he sent a messenger to take Lot and his two kids out of this place just before he judged it. And so God took them out into a place of safety, away from shocking instances similar to what's happening in our country in New Zealand today. And now out of this place called Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's wife decides to look back. Longing, looking back in her heart, longing for what she thought she wanted to preserve, to which God had said, leave it all behind. Now this is the dilemma that many people face today in the church. There's something in your life that God has pulled you out of. He's pulled you out of the kingdom of darkness and into his glorious light, but you're looking back and wanting to preserve just something that you think was good and not remembering all the things that were bad. It's like going back to an old girlfriend. It just doesn't work out. And God is wanting to draw you out and where you are, and in a sense you have a vision of what might happen, what happiness might look like, and what your life should look like, but that vision is very, very temporary and short-sighted. But many people look back to that which was left behind. And God is actually trying to draw you out of the situation. They're looking back, believing there's something of great value back there. But God says, no, look ahead. Therefore, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature and all things have passed away. And behold, all things are new. All things have passed away. They're not there anymore. It's an illusion. And God is saying, I want, to leave, want you to leave these things behind, what has been left behind. And no one puts his hand to the plough and looks back, which is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Now thinking about Lot's wife and what happened, she looked behind and she brought incredible loss, not only to herself, but to her family and the nation. You all know the story of her looking behind. She was destined to have a good life. She was destined to bring a, a, a blessing to a nation. And you think about it, what could have been, but history tells us that she lost everything that God had for her. In fact, she brought incest into her home and from her family and from her two daughters and her husband came two tribes named the Moabites and the Amorites to which both became enemies of the living God. Maybe Lot remembered her comfortable situation Maybe she remembered her bed. Maybe she remembered her friends. And she looked ahead with anguish, wanting to go back. I have no clue what Lot was on about, what she was looking back on and what she was longing for. But all I do know, she brought heartache to her home. And I know that Lot's wife brought heartache to a nation. And when you stop and think about it, just one person that looks back and not willing to leave it all behind, there are certain things in life we must leave behind so we fail to create a total disaster in our lives, like, like Lot's wife that looked back. Even the things we thought that were good, clearly when she looked around, she had to think there had to be something good back there. And I don't know that what it was. It may have been a nice house. She may have had a little business. She may have had a little nice circle of friends. I don't know, but sometimes God takes us out of these comfort zones. I don't know what it was. All I know is that when she, Lot's wife looked back, she brought incredible heartache into thousands of people in a nation. And when you stop and think about this story, those that will not go into what God has in store for them, for us, the heartache it brings to our families, our business, our friends, and everyone we touch and associate with all. And times God will take us out of a church, out of our friends, get rid of them overnight. And you look back and you're thinking, I wish they'd never left, wish they'd never gone. But God has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness into his glorious light. And we are to look forward. Whoever decides to save his life will lose it. 
Whoever loses his life will find it. In other words, let go of the past. Let go of the friends that have diced on you and what I think what will make my life happy. Stop thinking if only and say, I don't know what I, you have for me, God, but I do know this thing. Whatever you have for me is better for my own heart, better than my own imagination. So I'm going with God. And what you have for me, I'm willing to lose what I have and what you have for me. So it will bring a blessing to my family and my friends and our lives. And this was the exact dilemma that the children of Israel found themselves in. That they were in Egypt and they were, the whole generation ended up living in a very dry, barren light land. And here is the reason why they wanted out of captivity. They wanted out of the kingdom of darkness. Just like many listening on this broadcast, you have an addiction. Your marriage is a total mess. You're, you're, you're making fools of yourself. You're messing up friends. You're suffering from unbelief. You're beginning to believe now that there may be no God. No one else does, so why should I? In hospital, I went around and visited many people as I was the most mobile and I'd ask the question, do you have a faith in God? And you would be surprised, nearly everyone I visited had no faith in the living God. Old people travelled their whole life not knowing God. And here you are, you think you need to be near the beach with a view to make you happy. You have a drug addiction and all these cravings you want out but you have no clue how to be free and your whole vision is just if God would get me out of this mess, what a wonderful life I would have. So in faithfulness, God takes you out of this mess and brings them in, you into the kingdom of light and out of darkness and delivers you. But the problem with this generation, they want to come out of the kingdom of darkness, they want to come out of bondage, just like the children of Israel but they don't want to go into the promised land that God has prepared for them, that the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard. They want to come out what was oppressing them, that they don't want to make the journey in. They don't want to come into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. A lot of people are like this and they want out of the bad marriage. They want out of the addiction. They want out of the obsessions, out of the stuff. And God in his mercy hears your cry and takes you out. But did you know that God has got something much, much bigger and higher than taking you out? He wants to take you in, into something that only God can bring you into. He wants to bring you into liberty. He wants to bring you into the glorious light. He wants to give you the reflection of his character. And Paul says in Philippians, not that I have already attained. None of us have attained. Or am, or, am I, or am I already perfect? And none of us are perfect. But I press on, not looking back that I may lay hold on that which Jesus Christ has laid hold for me. Folks, he has something laid hold for you this morning. In other words, I could have been called for the purpose outside of my own ability, my own un understanding, outside of my own strength in the natural that only God could understand, Paul says. And Paul say he doesn't understand it because he hasn't attained it. And nor have we, but we are looking forward out of the kingdom of darkness and into the glorious light. I'm 71 years of age now and I feel that I've not attained in life what God had fully called me to do. But the good news is this, folks. It's never too late. Maybe I could sit down on some island in Asia, leaving a trail of disaster and disappointment behind. But one thing I do know, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, coming into the kingdom of light. And I press forward to the mark of the prize court of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many as it be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it to you this morning. Paul is saying, I'm moving with God. Are you not glad that 
Paul didn't li listen to Abacus, a true prophet of God, who took off his belt and bound his hands and said, This unto thee be shall be the man that wears this. And he shall be imprisoned and you will be in bonds and prison and awaits you. And Paul says, What on earth are you talking about? No way am I going to prison. Are you trying to break my heart? Are you trying to turn me from the will of God? And in the, Paul, in the end, Paul relents and breaks down and says this, Let this be the will of the Lord, for I shall look forward to what he has for me. We're all so grateful that Paul didn't seek to save his life, and I'm thankful he went to prison because even to this day he penned some of the greatest theological letters to which the church even burns and believes and is written and stands on today. And you can imagine the people saying that Paul could have had saved himself. He could have conducted big miracles, big tent crusades. He could have had a big fancy stainless steel church with coffee and cakes, fancy sermons saving people, but instead all he had was a pen and a piece of paper in prison, writing a few letters to his friends that he left behind, not fully comprehending that all things work together for good to those that love him. And Paul's penning doctrine and theology has lasted for the last 2,000 years from a jail knowing that he was pressing towards the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. And folks, it's not always the easy path. It's not always the glittery path. It's not always the path that is the most attractive. It's not the path of the great evangelists with millions of television stations. It could be a path to lose all your friends. It could be a pathway where everybody hates you and jilts you. And yes, even the people in the church. You see, self-preservation is the core of the weakness of the church today. Theologically, we've lived in a in the church to preserve ourselves, going to church, seeing who, can, who I can make, what business deal can I do? I like it that way. The church suits me. Don't mention the blood. Don't say anything about hell or judgment. I'm happy with that. And when do, do you ever hear about this in the woke churches? It's not PC and the church has become captors of councils and governments helping to buy entertainment centers so you can have a little church with a happy, non-effective people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at the end, say nothing that will challenge anyone or offend anybody for the sake of the cross. And what is it to bless me? A scone and a cup of coffee at the end of the day. And because of this weak testimony, the church has become so compliant and so weak and so PC, by the way, saying nothing about sin. I don't want to hear about it. That way I'm happy looking back and enjoying my sin. But by God's grace, the church will be shaken one more time and wake up this woke garbage that's landed in the churches today, which has brought nothing but captivity in the churches once they find out they've all been lied to and conned and made to feel comfortable with no conviction told a history lesson every Sunday and never coming to the knowledge of what God has in store for the church apart from old people dead scared of going to hell and never mind a whole lost generation and never mind the grandchildren and the kids at schools and the universities and families hurling into a Christless eternity. It is the most unlikely that God will choose to make a dis difference and carry the testimony of God to carry the flame of the gospel. It's time to rise up. It's time to get up. It's time to get out. And it's time to get out, go in. Not just get out of your circumstances, but go on to what God has for your life. Throw your head in the ring and nail your colours to the mast for the glory of God with souls and men. I am no matter what it costs. Let us therefore as many be perfect, thus be minded. You know, there's so many people that come out of bondage that all they can ever talk about is when they came out of bondage, but never going in. And it reminds me of a story about an old man that had a testimony folded up in a piece of paper and every time somebody came around, he'd ask his grandson to go up to the top shelf and ask his grandchild to go to the top drawer. 
and get my testimony and read it out to everybody that would come to the home. It was a testimony that happened 10 years ago. It wasn't current. It wasn't fresh. And one day, someone else came to the front door and Granddad asked the grandson, please go upstairs to the drawer, the top drawer, and find my testimony. I want to read it out. Only to find that the testimony had been eaten by mice. The grand said, I'm sorry, Granddad, your testimony is gone. The mice ate your testimony. I don't know about you, but I want a fresh testimony every day from the living God. Not something that happened 10 years ago. So my question is this to you this morning. What is the focus of your life? Are you just wanting to get out? Are you just wanting to get out of addiction? Are you just wanting to get out of alcoholism? Are you just wanting to get out of a bad marriage and your circumstances? But are you prepared this morning to go into the glory of God and his glorious light? You see, this is a choice that we all need to make and I believe that a lot of people are not free because you're not ready to go in. You see, many people do not get an answer from God because they're not, they're wanting to look back, they're wanting to preserve something that God has actually taken you away from and continually looking back when you're meant to be marching up in the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day, as the song would say. The Bible speaks about a woman named Hannah. She was empty and many of you are empty looking at things which are looking back. She couldn't have a baby. It was like a shame in her life which was not fulfilled. And many of you are not fulfilled. And many of you are barren. And she would go to church every week like you would go to church every week. And she would ask God to do something and go home. And she'd feel empty again. And many of you are going home after church feeling empty in a few hours. And just like Hannah, she finally came to the place that the words had no effect anymore. Many of you have prayed with no effect. And many of you have prayed with no answers. And she'd come to the house of God and she was in such a sorrow. So much sorrow she couldn't even move her light lips. And words would fail her. That finally something came out of the heart of God, which God had been waiting for her to say. You see, God was not willing to take her out until she was willing to go in. And she finally says these words. If you would just give me a baby, I will hand it back to you and go in for your glory. And it was at that moment Eli the priest told her to go home and the Lord has granted her request. And she went home and she was sad no more. And from that empty womb was born this prophet Samuel who led the nation for 40 years. You see, many of you are not prepared to go in. You're not prepared to go to the distance. And she didn't say, give me a baby so I'll be happy. Give me a new house. She said, take me just out. Take me in for all you have in store for my baby. And Samuel led the nation for 40 years. So the challenge this morning is this. It's not good enough to say, take me out. But have you asked God to take you in? Take me into all that you have for my life. Leaving behind and pressing on to the high calling in Christ Jesus, who's taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and into his glorious light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've taken us out. We ask that we look forward, leaving these things behind so we can be a new creation by being swept into what God has in store for us. We ask this in your precious name. Amen.